Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm Jim Goddard. John, welcome back to the show. Jim, glad to be back. John, was Scandium International the star of last weekend's Metals Investors Forum in Vancouver? George Putnam gave, I believe, the best presentation ever in his my session. He only had 10 or so minutes to do so. Uh, George Putnam is, by nature, a very cautious individual who never wants to, uh, you know, get anybody too excited about uh, anything. Uh, but his body language suggested a, a confidence that I have not seen so far in the um, whatever eight years that I have followed this story. Now, I wouldn't say that they were the star of the show because the story is very, very subtle. But I did learn a number of very important things that has me quite excited. And tonight I'll publish uh, an update that gives a complete overview of where this story is going and what the timeline is. Talking to uh, my subscribers and also other delegates who are at the conference, uh, there are three questions that seemed to dominate. The first was, why was SCY's stock price rising during the past week? On about September 20th or so, it was still below 20 cents, but then it started to rise. And yesterday, it traded as high as 32 cents. It's back to 24 cents uh, today, but it has traded almost 4 million shares during this period. So after languishing in this sort of 15 to 18 cent uh, range for most of the year, what was changed? What has changed? The second question, which is uh, more important, is when will CapEx funding happen and at what price? And CapEx is $87 million U.S., which is about $114 million Canadian at today's exchange rates. And the third question is... Uh, uh, well, John, what is your price target for Scandium International? You can't ask the company that because they're not really allowed to say anything like that. So with regard to the first question, um, obvious explanation is uh, oh, there must be some news that somebody has advanced knowledge of. But when I talked to George and said, are, are you going to get in trouble because you've had a leak? And he just laughed and he said, there is nothing that is that we know about that's material that uh, would justify anybody wanting to cheat and buy the stock in, in the market. And he explained that uh, they are now in the zone where all these letters of intents that they have done with the disclosed partners and the dozen or so uh, undisclosed relationships with uh, very substantial parties uh, under their new Korea marketing strategy these relationships are now at the stage where any day he could get a phone call from a procurement officer saying, we want so and so much over the next three years. Now, the company uh, switched into this Korea marketing strategy in late 2017 and basically forgot to explain to everybody, including me, what their strategy would be. And they were punished earlier this year when expectations that once the uh, Evansons converted their 20% project interest into a uh, uh, equity stake in the company, that we would get CapEx funding uh, uh, very quickly and that uh, they'd start building this mine. And we'd be right now in the final uh, stages of uh, construction with a uh, production to start in uh, 2019. Well, they had realized that uh, getting a large offtake agreement from one party or maybe two parties was not going to happen. Because even though this is a company whose management consists of XBHP and Bechtel people and, 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 and top-notch metallurgical talent creating a flow sheet using a conventional technology, uh, the laterite material that's being put into this system, yes, it's been done with uh, HPAL, and uh, with uh, solvent extraction, but nobody has ever attempted to recover scandium at that scale. So there is still technical risk that after it's all built at the commercial scale, it does not quite work as planned. And so all these end users have been reluctant to commit 
to any sort of offtake orders when they could be stuck waiting and nothing gets delivered because there are problems or the recovery is too low, the cost is too high, the plug gets pulled on the operation, and any investment they have made in either marketing to sell the components with the aluminum scandium alloy in it or the tooling up costs, that's a write-off. So that this strategy involves now going to dozens of potential end users and looking for smallish deals, you know, maybe one to three tons, maybe more in some cases uh, from each one, uh, so that if they, if if uh, Scandium International does not deliver, then well, it's not a huge loss to the company. And the beauty of this strategy, while it doesn't look very good when you announce this little one here and this little one there, is that all of these deals potentially translate into substantially larger orders afterwards. And one of the interesting things about the uh, the Ningen project and all the other ones, uh, the half dozen or so that have similar type of uh, uh, ore with with similar grades, is that uh, they have a lot of supply potential. And, and, And so scaling up supply to meet demand is going to happen once it's demonstrated that primary scalable supply is a reality. Now, every time I've asked George Putnam, uh, when when is this finally going to start happening? When are we going to get this uh, off-take agreement? And uh, he would say, well, it could happen tomorrow or it could happen two years from now, which is not exactly what I or anybody else wants to hear because in this bear market that we're in, uh, we're assuming, okay, it's going to take another two years, so maybe I should sell my stock and go chase after something that's moving and come back two years from now. Maybe it'll even be cheaper than, than it is now. But for the first time ever, I got a distinct timeline from George. He said during Q4 through of 2018 through Q1 of 2019, we expect to fill an order book of the first three years of output, which is about 80 tons when you adjust for the um, the ramp up the ramp up plan. And the interesting thing is, because of these undisclosed parties, and all of them being in the sort of position now after getting sample material, testing it to confirm that it does have the uh, functional specifications that the uh, that that SCY has said they have, and building uh, prototypes for their components, either simply as a computer model or as a physical prototype, they're all coming into position to be able to say, we like this, it works for us, we will make money using aluminum scandium alloy instead of whatever else we have been using. We need to commit to get at least uh, enough for an initial production run two and a half years from now when this, uh, or two years from now when this is all in in production. And uh, these big ones that do not want their names used are brand names, and George won't tell me or anybody anything because this is so sensitive that the, the potential deal could evaporate if there was any leak uh, whatsoever. These groups are sensitive about two things. One is they are worried that their competitors will see what they are doing and also join the fray. So they don't want anybody to know that they are playing with aluminum scandium alloy. The other thing that they don't want is the publicity that an announcement about such and such a big company where the market can see, wow, so so they commit for four or five tons, they have the potential to you know, take a lot more that would immediately uh, um, uh, uh, cause the market uh, and especially the other potential off-takers to realize, ooh, we better get off the fence and make a deal because if this party finally makes up its mind, there's going to be nothing left. So they don't really want to encourage any of these other parties to go in there, clean up the uh, first... uh, three years production of 80 tons, and then this entity, after finding out that this is exactly what we need, has to wait until the uh, expansion scale-up in the third year of production. So 
hence the secrecy. So what is going to happen in the next six months is we're going to start seeing these smallish offtake deals announced. And of the seven ones that they uh, announced, uh, the letters of intents where they disclosed the party, the, the most important one is, is Grangie's, which makes heat exchangers and has a substantially big market that conceivably could take all of the uh, output uh, from the first three years. But they again, they are not going to do that because why plan for something that, because Mother Nature is quirky, will not uh, uh, actually uh, be possible to do. But uh, if Grangies or one of these other big branded secret ones comes out and does something, then we will see a cascade of similar offtakes and the order book will get filled. So this is what I think was happening in the market in the past week was the realization that the audiences on the sidelines uh, can see that the company is heading into the zone where things could happen very quickly. It might indeed take until uh, March of next year for all of this to come together. But when the order book gets filled, then CapEx financing becomes a no-brainer. And so the question is, at what price could that possibly happen? And uh, so I've looked at an all-equity type of financing. And, uh, you know, if, if they do that $0.10 cents where the stock isn't now, that would be about 1.1 billion shares of uh, dilution. And if they do that a buck, it would be uh, uh, about, about a tenth of that, you know, 111 million. A reasonable range based on my modeling of the project's uh, growth potential is in the 50 to 70 cent range. So I'm guessing that uh, when all this news comes out, the stock will end up settling in some range where the uh, financing might get done at 60 cents, and that would be about uh, uh, 188 million shares. And that would be the window where big players get to position themselves. And this could happen very rapidly, which is why there was interest at the conference in this story and maybe hope that on Monday there would be some big announcement of such a deal. But uh, that is not the case, yet it could happen happen any day. Now, the at the conference, in my presentation, I spelled out something else which people do not quite understand. And part of my talk was explaining that the cannabis sector has classic bubble characteristics because any of the main contenders in there could be the winner, which takes all, of a market whose size, whose, whose, up, whose total size is indeterminate at this stage. Now, we can look at Canada, where it becomes legal in uh, mid-October, and say, okay, there's 35 million people here, and so-and-so many are going to start uh, consuming uh, uh, cannabis uh, products, and it's going to be worth such and such uh, revenue. And after it's legal, uh, everybody switches to the bottom line and says, okay, now that it's legal, show us how profitable uh, this uh, product is that has relatively limited barriers of entry other than, uh, than, than permitting by, by the authorities uh, for, for, for grow-up facilities. Uh, let's see how profitable it actually is, and that should be the end of the cannabis bubble. But what's happened is that the big groups like Constellation Brands and Coca-Cola have started investing money. Uh, they're moving into this space because they can see that beyond 2020, when there's a potential government change in the United States, cannabis will become, recreational use of cannabis will become legal at the federal level, which will enable uh, all these states that already have uh, legalized it, such as California and Colorado, to really ramp up. So in essence, the cannabis bubble in Canada has been given a two-year extension where all the losses on the bottom line can be explained as this is all part of market development because the U.S. market is 10 times bigger than Canada. And the cannabis sector, because it has this uh, open blue sky, uh, uh, it, it has been sucking the oxygen out of the, the high-risk capital room for the uh, resource juniors because with the resource junior, you can always 
see what the upside limit is based on the size and grade of the deposit and the metal price. The only time you get bubble conditions in the uh, resource junior sector is when there is a metal price uptrend that seems to have no limit. And because of the extraordinary leverage as the metal price goes up and low-grade deposits suddenly come into money, uh, stocks can go absolutely crazy. And the other type of bubble is a discovery bubble where there's a new emerging discovery whose limits also cannot be determined and which has replication potential amongst other juniors to deliver something similar, perhaps even better. We do not have those conditions uh, at work right now. We have a, we, we thought we had Novo last year with its Pilbara discovery, but that is basically on hold until they show us how to measure uh, uh, where the uh, uh, gold nuggets are in sufficient quantity to, to be worth mining. But the Scandium International story is, meets the uh, conceptual or the bubble criteria that these conceptual stories have. In the first place, Scandium International is now the first mover in this space. They have their permit. They are in an advanced stage of uh, market development uh, by moving downstream into the uh, master uh, aluminum scandium alloy business and being able to deal directly with fabricators and, and, and parts man manufacturers. And uh, the other parties are several years behind. The closest is, uh, is Cleantech, which is committed to doing the large-scale uh, nickel-cobalt operation with a scandium byproduct uh, that will uh, uh, come into uh, you know, effect in, in 2023. And so Scandium International, by, by developing the market, by being the first to deliver the product, by having the in-house expertise in processing these types of deposit, it is the candidate to become the winner takes all. And in terms of the size of the market, uh, I reverse engineered the uh, bubble chart uh, that uh, SEY published in June where they showed the, the size of the different sectors, whether, whether they're price sensitive and or early adopter or, or late adopters. And when I unfolded that as a demand evolution graph, I realized that over the next 10 years, this market right now, which is supplied with about 10 to 15 tons of scandium oxide, could become a 1,000 to 1,500 ton per year market, which uh, from Ningen, uh, you know, 100, ton, 100, 100 tons, maybe 150 tons, uh, uh, Honey Bugle, which they also own, could be another 100, Kevinimi in Finland could be another 100. So even with everything that uh, 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 SCY has got going, they will be able to supply only a portion of the demand that will start to kick in when the end users realize that the primary scalable scandium oxide supply is possible at a stable price. And that means all these other five or six juniors, which also have deposits which are very similar, uh, they will suddenly become part of the bubble, the race to get into production. But similar to what we're seeing in the cannabis sector now, where you see the biggest companies uh, getting massive investments uh, from groups like Constellation Brands and then acquiring the uh, the ones that are, are smaller or are farther behind, aggregating them. So in a similar way, Scandium International could potentially be the aggregator that, uh, uh, that either joint ventures or acquires some of these others in order to capture uh, the bulk of this emerging Scandium market, which uh, at that $2,000 per kilo price, uh, uh, that that's a uh, a two billion to two and a half billion dollar market, and that is the size of the niobium market. And it took CBMM forty years to develop that uh, market uh, when Arasha was real recognized for what it was in the uh, in the early sixties. Things go a lot faster these way these days. The light weighting trend for aluminum alloys, that's of interest no matter what your political ideology is in terms of transportation, fuels, making stuff lighter without compromising strength and safety and other functionality, that's a no-brainer. New materials that accomplish that are uh, going to be adopted very rapidly once they're available. The problem with scandium has always been that it's never been available 
except as a pitiful byproduct supply. Everybody understands what can be done with it. So here we have a junior which uh, could go into bubble mode once it has its CapEx financing in place. And so that then takes us to the uh, third question of what is my price target? And, and I can come up with something like, a, you know, a $1 to $2 price range uh, three years from now based on just the Ningen operation. But if the bubble dynamics of this story become part of the market's awareness, I have no idea how high a story like this can go. So we're not there yet, but the latency is there. People were interested. The company is now in the zone where all of this could start coming together quickly. I wouldn't say it was the star of the Metals Investor Forum, but I would say that anybody paying attention will see that this is an emerging star that maybe even at the within within a few months would be the company that everybody would be flocking to completely excited about. We'll have more with John Kaiser next. That Adventures Corp is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Vatix management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Vatic will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Vatic trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, vaticventures.com. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, what company would you describe as the star of the Metals Investor Forum in Vancouver? I would say that Nevada Exploration Inc., for people paying attention, is the star of the show. And they presented in Gwen Preston's session because she picked the company up a, a year ago and has been recommending it to her audience. And this was Saturday afternoon. So people did not really have a chance to uh, 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 really follow up because it's late, late in the day on a Saturday, and uh, but the Dennis Higgs, who is the chairman, uh, for the first time did the presentation, and he did an outstanding job articulating the story, and there was a whole bunch of new stuff in it too, which I was able to get uh, more information about going over to the table and and picking James Buskert's brain about all this stuff. Uh, this is why these uh, Metals Investor Forum conf- uh, conferences are, are are so useful because you, you, you get the reason to look at the company in your 10-minute presentation and then you head on over and get a lot more details. Now, what makes this company the star is that after, what, 15 years of toiling in the wilderness with their groundwater um, uh, gold and groundwater technology, looking for uh, Carlin-type gold deposits. They're finally in a position to drill a very high-stakes target that literally could take the stock to the moon. Now, the Scandium International story is going to be a gradual, long-running story that evolves over time. In discovery exploration, one news release could send a stock into orbit. At the South Grass Valley project, uh, they have developed a gold in groundwater with support from all the Pathfinder uh, Carlin type uh, elements. Uh, that's very prominent. It covers a fairly large area, and they have started a 15-hole drill program, of which the uh, first uh, six holes will be pro- will be spaced on a grid of about a thousand meter spacing, and these are very widely spaced holes and the target they they know there is lower plate rock underneath the gravels um, and uh, and the golden groundwater anomaly says there is something there but where exactly it is it is hard to tell it could be some uh, 
uh, a elongated uh, breccia body like Gold Rush with its 15 million ounce zones, which uh, uh, it's hard to miss once you decide to drill in the area. Or it could be a uh, something like Cortez Hills, which has very unusual geometry, uh, vertical. If, if something has a vertical geometry with like two ounce per ton gold, and you know, is a 10 to 15 million ounce deposit, uh, you're not going to hit it unless you're extremely lucky with thousand meter spaced holes. So that takes us back to uh, uh, you know four four years or so ago when McEwen Mining drilled that first hole at the uh, Grass Valley, which is at the northern end of the valley, and they did one hole, and they walked after that. So you ask yourself, is this stock going to just uh, tank when they drill the first hole and it comes up with no gold in it? Well, this time, there is something different going on. And this was the big exciting thing that I picked up when I sat down with James Buskard and had him explain to me what all this... uh, uh, MRDU talk was all about. The Minerals Deposit Research Unit at UBC in Vancouver does a lot of scientific research. And for the past 10 years, they have been fed, I think it's up to 10,000 samples from the Newmont and Barrick from Carlin, from their Carlin type systems, not, not just the very close to the deposit, but also holes drilled quite far away. And what they did was a systematic study looking at how far from the deposition center, in other words, where the gold drops out and forms the deposit that you want to mine, the fluids migrate within the carbonates and drop out the other pathfinder elements as well as oxygen isotopes. And they've developed a model of this one drops out first, this one drops out later, and uh, and this one uh, drops out the out the furthest. And what this means is that you have a geochemical zonation model so that if you're drilling in the vicinity of a big Carlin type deposit and you you don't worry about hitting the gold, you worry about what these other pathfinder elements are grading and not in the one hole, but in relative terms to each other. So that as they plot up these results from, let's say, six barren holes, they will be able to vector in on where the target is. And this is something, this, 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 the, the results of this study only came out about three or four months ago and, and is just being deployed. And this makes this program that they're doing much more exciting because if normally you drill six dusters, everybody says, that's it, your story's dead. In this case, if it starts delivering this zonation pattern, they will home in on where the discovery is. So this means we're not going to sit here and wait for, uh, you, you know, six, six, eight weeks, and then the thing goes to 10 cents, and uh, and the story's all over, and the uh, golden groundwater method uh, does not get valid validation. No, we could still get, like, shocking news that this stuff is tombstone all over the place, in which case we will have to go back and say, this golden groundwater stuff really isn't useful, which is the wall of skepticism that the company has been encountering uh, from the market. But this time around, they have a method where they can keep homing in. And if they actually got lucky and hit some, uh, you know, hole, uh, you know, 50 meters of two ounce gold, uh, uh, the, the stock would go absolutely crazy. Uh, because nobody would have drilled in this area. Kennecott drilled a few holes under the gravels after sort of finding nothing in the outcropping part of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the lower plate. But uh, they never quite got to where the plume, the gold water, the, the, the golden groundwater anomaly shows up because they really didn't have a two like that. They were just drilling a series of blind holes hoping that it might get better. It didn't seem to get better. They didn't really have this type of uh, uh, pathfinder zonation model that has now emerged. And, and of course, the big guys submitted all this stuff to the MRDU uh, because they wanted the science so that uh, they can also home in within their brownfields uh, properties. And, and the four-mile discovery of uh, that, that Barrick has announced, you know, very higher grade than uh, 
gold rush itself and to the north and deeper, they know that once you're in one of these Carlin type systems, there is a lot more to be found. So watching that presentation, uh, I would say, uh, you know, Nevada Exploration Inc. is the stock I would uh, run out and, and buy right now ahead of this. And if they do have a discovery or even something that starts to smell like a discovery, the replication possibilities, they could go back to Grass Valley at the northern end of that uh, that valley and start doing work. They have a dozen similar hot spots that they generated through their 6,000 samples of regional reconnaissance sampling uh, that uh, gave a kick that requires follow-up. They could go out there and stake that for a uh, you know, tie that up for a couple of million bucks, uh, they could potentially repeat this over and over again, which is why Nevada Exploration Inc. is a potential bubble stock. But until they actually hit, make this discovery in an area where nobody in their right mind would dream dream of drilling a hole, uh, the, the, there's going to, the stock's going to be relatively cheap. But watch out if they succeed and deliver a proof of concept. Discovery Watch will be right back with John Kaiser. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol, PBX, and on the OTCQB symbol, PWWBF, and on Frankfurt symbol, 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. I'm Brian Fowler, President of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, anything else catch your attention at the Metals Investor Forum that could compete with Royal Nichols' big discovery of giant golden boulders? Well, for those who are tuning in for the first time, what's exciting about Royal Nichols' beta hunt story is that in this uh, ratty uh, system that they had there in the Cambalda district where they were first mining what was left over of nickel and then chasing uh uh, gold in these sheer structures, but not getting super grades and trying to unload the project. Uh, they came to a realization that, uh, the, where the shears intersect with the, uh, uh, um, the, this, this pyritic shale, fairly thin horizon, uh, that's where substantial gold enrichment appears to have taken place. And if this model is correct, uh, uh, it's almost going to be like four pencil-like deposits, you know, locally broken up that could grade very high-grade gold. And so the, this company, Royal Nickel, has gone from being near dead below a dime to trading as high as a dollar eighteen. It's all over the map because nobody knows what the average grade is going to be of this enriched material and how long it will take to find it. But it is in production already. They don't need any permits. They just need to find it. So now we have possibility that uh, uh, maybe this could end up being one to two million ounce system, uh, maybe more if uh, there's more to this than just these shears intersecting with this uh, py pyritic horizon. But the possibility is that it is extremely high grade, extremely profitable. And they, uh, they, they've, they've paid off a uh, the debt that uh, was supposed to be extinguished uh, by unloading the project on a buyer from the 24,000 ounces they have recovered from this uh, super zone. Uh, they've just raised $8.4 million. They are cleaning up their balance sheet. Uh, when they keep mining, they can conceivably uh, 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 go, ca go substantially cash positive. Um, and, uh, but the key here will be to drill this off systematically uh it's it's too deep to really want to do it from 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 surface but from underground trace out these horizons mine them as you find them uh it's an exciting story uh 
in terms of valuation, it's hard to put a limit on it now. Uh, at the Share Collective, uh, there's been a couple attempts. Somebody uh, envisioned 5 million tons of 4.5 grams per ton, um, operated at uh, 1. Uh, 1,700 tons per day, and, and that comes out uh, with a price target of like 34 cents, which is not what anybody wants to hear. It's only 700,000 ounces. But somebody else came up and said, nah, we're going to find a half million tons of 150 grams and just mine it at 200 tons per day and direct uh, ship it to the to the smelter over the next 10 years. And that ends up uh, translating into a uh, 280 stock target, uh, you know, with, with no additional dilution from, from any additional financing. So this type of story where there is such a range of possible outcomes this is what gets the market excited because you're going to have the bears saying, nah, it's not going to amount to more than a hill of beans, and others are going to say it's going to be an extraordinary jackpot. The Great Bear discovery at the Dixie Project, which is south of Red Lake, is similar in that uh, they have tackled a part of a, of a fold, uh, a D1 fold, which has never been drilled. All the activity in the past by Tech and others has been on the north limb of uh, the similar of this uh, Red uh, Red Lake uh, Greenstone Belt Rock, and they've gotten gold in there, but it's nothing exciting. Nobody's ever developed it. And what Great Bear did, and this is what was really good about the conference, I was able to sit down and have it explained to me why they did not just find some little remnant that tech and the others all manage to overlook, and you just maybe have this little pocket. And, and therein lies the similarity to the beta hunt, because the bears are all saying, yeah, you found a lucky pocket there, there's not going to be much more to it, you're wasting your time, everybody's going to have tears at the end of the day, but there is a model there, and as they do more work and start to validate the model, same sort of situation with Great Bear. What they did was a geophysical survey, which brought into greater focus this um, D1 uh, fold, and they saw there's also a south limb, and that's probably not so exciting. It would probably be similar to the north limb, but in the hinge of this fold where they were drilling, the hinges is where the uh, Red Lake-style mineralization from these orogenic uh, mesothermal uh, uh, systems, uh, that's where the gold really tends to pile up. And so when they drilled into this area, it had not really had any drill holes before. And when they got the high grade that looks very similar to uh, what Gold Corp has at, uh, at, at Red Lake, uh, that's why uh, um, Rob McEwen jumped in there with six million bucks, uh, four million from himself, and the other million and a half or two million from uh, his, his company, and the rest was done by others so that they have just raised $10 million. The company does not have a lot of stock out. It's in that sort of dollar seventy to $2 range. And uh, if they end up having something similar to Red Lake, which itself was a, you know, 22 million ounce, uh, has, has already produced 22 million ounces uh, at, at uh, about more, just more over half an ounce uh, gold average, uh, this thing could also literally go to the moon. And so What's key here is that the hinge fold's great, but they have also a what they call a D2 fold apparently intersecting with this hinge. So in other words, it's a depositional sweet spot that they believe they have discovered. And of course, there will be these systems have substantial vertical. This is fairly close to surface. So this could be another major... Uh, sort of node in the whole Red Lake district that becomes that ends up generating substantial new high grade ounces. So I would say uh yeah this great bear and its story uh because it doesn't have a huge number of shares out uh, uh this is the kind of stock that could reach double digits if the drilling continues to show that yes this stuff is continuous we keep finding more we have another Red Lake situation on a hand similar to the, what we had in 1999, 2000. And that is what captures the public's imagination. People don't really notice that uh, a, uh, a Royal Nickel going from nine cents to, uh, to a buck, you know, a 10-bagger, 
uh, th- that's not as impressive. And that's because the company has 400 million shares out. They seem to be more impressed when some 30 cent stock ends up going to 15, 20, 20 dollars. And that's what captures the public's imagination. The public just isn't geared towards doing valuation on based on the value of the company rather than on the stock price. So Great Bear has the potential to become one of those jaw-dropping, eye-opening uh, discoveries simply because its stock price goes into double digits on the backs of a discovery that the market starts to believe is another Red Lake in the making. John, thanks for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser, his website, kaiserresearch.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Discovery Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Discovery Watch is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.